Welcome, Wargamers, to the really, really rough Earth days of the Mortal Realms, because today we are concluding our chat about the Reign of the Brute, or sorry, Reign of the Brute, the uh, narrative campaign book that just came out for the Dawnbringers Crusade uh, for AOS. This is part two of that campaign book, but part five of my coverage of Reign of the Brute. And in this one, we're going to be concluding the Giran side of the Twin-Tailed Crusade. Now, if you want to understand the context of this next little bit and you're just jumping in, I have a playlist that's all about the Dawnbringers Crusade series. You can jump into episode one of Reign of the Brute and get yourself caught up. I'll have a link to those in the description down below. But there was a little preface, a little, little side story we go on here that I thought would be fun to throw up top right before we get into our story. And that is, we learn that Hornsplitter, the mega boss on the new Ma Grunta model that was uh, attacking and harassing our Guran Dawnbringer Crusade before, well, he was led away from them by the Stormcast Eternals, kind of like parrying them and just kind of like harassing them to pull the army away from the Crusade. And then they were ditched. And he loses the Stormcast Eternals, he's absolutely furious about it, and immediately just does a heel turn and goes directly into the forest after the uh, crusade that he lost. But as he's chasing after them, he runs across a weird gap. And by gap I mean there's just a weird line, like a straight line carved into the forest. And so they all stop and they're like, wait... Is this evidence of the humans? Does this mean that they walk through here or what? And so, meaning that, hoping that this will lead them to the crusade, they start running down this weird line that was all of a sudden cut through a thick forest. And instead of bumping into the rear of the Dawnbringer crusade, they find out what's actually making this line through the woods, and it is a Sons of Behemoth army? Uh, a club? I don't know group shindig i'm not really quite sure they're not really a war band per se but it's a huge gathering of sons of behemoth mega gargants and gargants and this particular gargant army is being led by none other than their named character king broad and he sets himself apart by pretty much being the only mega gargant with two brain cells to rub together their path whatever he's leading them towards is the thing that carved this perfect straight line through the forest and as Hornsplitter is taking this in, around the feet of these Mega Gargants is the other arm of Hornsplitter's army. You'll remember in the last episode we talked about he took all of his cavalry stuff because he was so impetuous looking for a fight. But he does have a foot troop based army and that is led by Zogrok Anvil Smasha, his second in command. And it turns out Anvil Smasha just kind of got lost and then found the Sons of Behemoth army and he's like, this is just as fun as following Hornsplitter so we'll tag along. And so this really begins our story of the Guran Crusade conclusion by being chased into the woods. They're running towards Fort Gardas, which right now is in the crosshairs of a devastating army of Gorkomorka, right? You got Iron Jaws. Uh, you know they're strong because they all got new models. Then there's the Sons of Behemoth who are just, it's a whole tribe of them walking through the woods towards this base. And so let's learn about the fate of the Crusade of Life. One thing before we jump into that, I'd like to say if you are interested in this faction or anything Aegis Sigmar, please, please consider using my affiliate link to Noble Knight Games. It's an awesome store here in the US. I am still working on getting you guys something in the UK if you'd like to support me. But since I have turned off advertising on my channel because YouTube ads are so intense right now, it would go an immensely long way to supporting the channel if you would use this link. Big or small, your purchase is going to supporting the channel, so go see if there's any hobby supplies for you. It supports me, my wife, our cats, the whole thing, and I'm so appreciative. And secondly, I want to throw out a shout out to Goonhammer. I'm part of their media network or whatever. Basically, if you're looking for any kind of Age of Sigmar tactics, tutorials, and model reviews, anything like that, they're going to have a whole spread on Dawnbringers, I'm sure. Go check out Goonhammer. So as I said, our story picks up with our heroes running through the woods, and it takes a, a slight detour to tell us more about what's actually going on in the Grimbark Forest. We're kind of learning this at piece by piece as our heroes are running, and this collection of Gargans here has been literally walking in a straight line through it. And this is a problem because this particular forest is also the home of the Dreadwood Glade of Sylvaneth. Now, if you're not familiar with them, these are like, 
the quote unquote evil Sylvaneth, the ones who just have no love for humanity. They are uncooperative with any other faction. You are tree or you are enemy. Well, what should walk through their home base but this huge army of Gargants? And when I say they carved a straight line, they literally walked through like the soul pod groves and crushed them. Which essentially, you, you pick the most, uh, we'll say, cranky of the Sylvaneth Glades, and then you destroy or mess with their ability to reproduce, slash be reborn. You know, they have a whole intricate thing with their soul pods. Go check out the Sylvaneth lore series. It's a big deal. And as they are doing this, they are ripping apart, you know, uh, ancients, batting aside dryads. It's just everything's bouncing off of them. And when this is happening, there is a wailing that is going out amongst the Sylvaneth spirit song. Essentially like a psychic shriek that all Sylvaneth, including Ilarial, can hear. The first to show up to this is Drycha, who is kind of like the patron saint of uh, the, the angry Sylvaneth. And as she shows up, some of the Donners are getting like picked and sniped off in the woods. Like if you're kind of on the periphery of the crusade, watching the sides, all of a sudden a tree branch will just like grab you by the throat and tear you into the woods. It's that kind of thing. Like they're just getting picked apart. And then Drycha reveals herself and is really coming in for the killing blow. And it's a great scene. They have like her beehives going crazy and it's just she's terrifying looking. But right as she goes about to strike, a huge horn blow goes off and a war song revenant with an envoy of tree revenants of Oakenbrow, which is sort of the polar opposite of Dreadwood, right? They're very open to other people. They're very, very uh, supportive of other factions as long as they're part of order. And they stop Drycha and the spite revenants from killing their crusade. They're like, hey, 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 listen, we, we can kill people all day, but that's not going to solve our problem. The Warsong Revenant is really the one who has enough perspective, I guess, because he was kind of outside of this, uh, watching these events. And he basically is able to inform the Crusade and Drycha of what's happening. That you two are not enemies. This is something way bigger than anything that's going on. And that you have an obligation to the mortal realms to, to not kill each other. This needs to expand. And not only that, but he knows where the Tide of Gargants is headed. And says, essentially, if we can't work together, we're all going to die. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this army, the Crusade, and head to Fort Gardas, as you were planning, but now we can expedite it because of Sylvaneth, you know, trickery going through all kinds of under passageways and that kind of stuff. But we're going to get there and try to defend them. And since all the things are converging on this one particular fort, let's talk about it. What is Fort Gardas, right? They have reinforcements coming from one direction, an unstoppable killing army on the other. What do they got? Well, uh, this is another small city that we have. It's not quite anything near as large as, say, Hammerhall. But it has a lot more staying power than the other city we mentioned in the Akshi Crusade, uh, Truce Break. It's much further along in its development. There's a storm keep here, which is sort of like a giant fortress monastery type thing for the Stormcast Eternals, which means there's also a steady retinue that's stationed there so they can be deployed out and help other crusades in Garan. Specifically, this is the Hallowed Knights. These are the very zealous and faithful servants of Sigmar, a heavy religious focus, that kind of thing. And the fort, as if you didn't know, is named Fort Gardas after Gardas Steel Soul, the Kind of like de facto charismatic leader of the Hallowed Knights. He's not actually like the actual top Stormcast. We don't see those really on the tabletop. Uh, at least they haven't really been represented very much. But he is up there in terms of like the heroic worship. Everybody knows Gardas. He has, he has a great book series. Go check him out if you haven't heard of this character. And as we learn more about this fort, it kind of opens up on a scene where it's Gardas standing and looking out like over the walls at the forest that's right next to their base. And the horde is essentially on his doorstep, right? There's there's a huge gaggle of orcs that are all like hurling spears and, and chucking stuff, trying to throw pigs at the wall as much as they can. You have mega gargants that are hurling boulders from, you know, an obscene distance away. And one of the things that he is noticing and, and, and very much acutely aware of is that this gaggle of gargants and orcs is uncharacteristically coordinated. Like in terms of how they throw their bodies in terms of waves and it just seems like there's sort of a mind behind this that is greater than the sum of its parts. Because these are all the dumbest things. For his defenses on Fort Gardas, 
He has, of course, his Celestar Ballistas, uh, but they're post-nerf, so they're not OP anymore. Also with Gardas is a contingent of about 200 Karajan Overlords, led by Admiral Krufen of Barak Zilfen. Now let's kind of take a detour here. It's not often that we find Karajan Overlord ground-based armies, but they are. And we learned that this little force actually started in the air. Uh, they were helping another civilization nearby with uh, acting as a mercenary company, just some hired guns. And then they met this Gargant horde and they were able to throw so many boulders into the sky that they blasted apart their transports. They just got knocked out of the air. So you have a lot of guns and a lot of power, but they don't have that sky advantage anymore. And with that, the Admiral fell back to his nearest location that he could reinforce, which was Fort Gardas. There really is no detail given to like that battle of the Gargants versus the KO. It really just kind of starts with the KO in the fortification and then gives you a little reason as to why. So we got Stormcast, we got the Stormkeep, we got Walls, we got Carriage and Overlords. The last thing to talk about for the defenses here is called the Saint's Shroud. Other cities have this. It's sort of like a, a well of magic that they can project around them, meant to stop demons and ethereal things. Uh, but the one here is so powerful that it can actually be used to repel physical attacks as well. As boulders are being thrown, they'll kind of bounce off a field and the walls are untouched. They perceive it as a literal shield of faith, like a magical barrier to protect everything outward and meant to stop anything physical or ethereal coming in. And it does a great job for a bit. As he's taking in the immensity of this army, the shield is holding. Any orcs who run up to it get like vaporized as they touch it. Uh, the boulders are getting smacked out of the sky. And King Broad is watching this and he is getting ticked. Okay, he does not like it. He is essentially the mind coordinating this assault. And so he screams at Gardas, like no, does the angry man uh, fist shake. And then he lifts his leg and begins stomping rhythmically, which is a thing that we've seen the Gargans do before. They use you know, feet and the sounds of stomping to communicate over large distances kind of a deal. Not intelligently or deeply, but just to kind of show that they're there. And so he starts stomping his foot rhythmically, and one by one, the other Gargants and Mega Gargants start doing the same. And Gardas is watching this, and he's realizing every time he stomps, his little shield of faith, the Saint Shroud, like, it lights up, it flickers, almost like it's being hit by something, everywhere at once. And as more of these Gargants join the stomping, gets hit harder and harder and harder everywhere at once. So at this point, he's realizing it's dawning on him, right? Like, my shield is starting to fail because of that thumping. Whatever they're doing, it is such a powerful blast of energy that it's messing with our de basic defenses. And we're getting the sense that every stomp was a blast of, like, primal magic. And this is where our boy, on his brand new model, Horn Splitter on the Maw Grunta sees his opportunity. And this is the coolest plan I think I've read in a while for orcs in a, in a campaign book, okay? Here it is. He's going to take his pigs on a long route to the fort, basically letting them run real fast and build up momentum for this epic charge. And his foot troops, including Anvil Smasher, are standing directly outside of the gate, like two feet from where the Saint Shroud is. So like, Anvil Smasher is in danger actively, but he's like right there at the last spot where you can reasonably charge into this gate. So while the shield is being battered, Horn Splitter and his Mogranta go into a long and powerful charge directly up the main bridge, straight to the front door. And he's going full speed, everything's kind of a blur, as he passes his dude on foot. Anvil Smasher hits his tools together and channels all of the green wa power from the entire orc horde, because now it's together, they converged at the door, and puts it all into horn splitter. And so this ma grunta becomes a actual like green locomotive of just hate, and it just smashes straight through the door. They turn their leader into a living missile, and I thought that was the coolest thing, because we don't often get good depictions of what support heroes look like, in, in action, but this one of the Anvil Smasher doing that same rhythm, working all of the orcs up, and then essentially like hucking him the ball of all this energy as he's charging in full speed. It just kind of seemed like a really cool 
way to demonstrate it mechanically where they're working together, but it's not intensely tactical. So he smashes through the door, and at this point, Gardas sees this, and he, he knows the momentum has just changed. Any hopes of defense that they had, uh, he did not anticipate them going not only through the Saint Shroud, but then immediately through the front door. And he's looking at this like, oh, my whole fortress is lost. Like, uh, there's nothing else to do for it because they don't have the defenses to hold this off if the entire army can walk in their front door. And so he kind of considers this, and then he starts giving commands. Uh, Tornus is there. He was able to fly faster than the Crusade, so he arrived at Fort Gardas faster. Or first, I should say. And he's telling Tornus, I want you to take all the civilians that are inside this city, and I want you to lead them out, specifically out of Northern Passage, and I want you to bring them to the Dawnbringer Crusade. They're going to join it. While you are doing that, we will stay, meaning the Hallowed Knights of Fort Gardas, and do essentially a rear guard action. We'll buy by your time, you guys escape, run away as fast as you can. And the KO captain right there, the carriage overlord guy, he's, he's super impressed and he swears to fight alongside Gardas to the bitter end, mainly because his alternative is returning home, maybe, uh, with no ships and nothing to his name. Right? He would be penniless and broken in a carriage and overlord society, so he's like, this is as good as that, I guess. And like I said, it's a rear guard action, kind of similar to the one we see on the actions, Akshi side, but there's a few big differences. This is not as weakly defended as Truce Break, right? Malkorn took his troops out and already spent all of his best things before the main fight. This is all the best things. They have a storm keep here, they have artillery, they have free guild, carriage and overlord reinforcements. But the Sons of Behemoth army is clearly being directed by King Broad. And it's so effective that the only reasonable defense is to, to just give all of this up and send a few, as many civilians as you can, away. Rather than being a rabble that just overran a civilization, this is a very focused thing. It's a different beast, so to speak. And sacrificing an entire keep, storm um, keep, anything like that, it's an immense sacrifice. And initially it pays off. The refugees make it out to the crusade who is now arriving. And Thorian is looking at this and really wants to go fight with Gardas, right? Uh, at this point, she's like, I just want to... Wouldn't it be so cool to like fight gallantly next to this demigod of faith and power that is Gardas? She kind of like swoons a bit, but kind of snaps back to it, realizes that's the wrong move. <laughs> he, he would die for nothing at that point, and uh, retreats quickly, ragged, but back on the road with a few more bodies to help keep the civilization going. Now that is it for the crusade itself in this book, meaning uh, the forces led by Thorian that survived all this, the humans, they're all gone. Presumably Tornus is with them still and they're redeemed because Gardas sent them away, but let's talk about the fate of Fort Gardas. As the main courtyard is kind of being overrun by orcs and gargants are starting to pour in stuff, uh, essentially, Gardas uses himself as bait. He kind of hurls all kinds of insults and charges specifically at Broad, pointing at him and you know trying to get him to see, I'm the leader of this army, you're the leader of that army, we should do battle like you and your buddy do when you're playing Warhammer and you just want to throw generals at each other. Because once the people are gone, which they do successfully, that's it. Like The doomed defense was already served its purpose of saving people, and so he's looking around and thinking, what other kinds of meaningful defeats can we achieve? And I love these stories. I love meaningful defeats because they end up being some of the most epic and heroic things in our history. And it's frankly one that I think Games Workshop is actually really good at writing. Uh, if you look at like the Horus Heresy, they have a great one with the drop site massacre. There are survivors of that, but they have to like, again, they lost, but they're fleeing and trying to survive. And in that there are some epic tales. Well, King Broad sees him, you know, he got his attention and charges. He swings his big old mace or club thing down into a wall section and devastates it. Uh, but Gardas was fast enough to jump out of the way because Gargant's hit on a four up. And so he missed. And with their prey in range, the trap that Gardas set is sprung. See that carriage and overlord army that was raining, uh, lining all the walls around here? Immediately, everyone turns, and the little like laser sights all fall on King Broad's head. He's got a few headshots from Vigilors, and they just light him up. The entire army is like, 
we need to take care of Broad. And so everything descends on him. Gardas, after he recovers, takes out his big old great hammer, runs in and does the epic hero, like two hands over the head, like Valhalla charge and comes down with the hammer and lights out for King Broad. He goes down, he collapses into the Basilica where the civilians were hiding just moments ago. And we don't know if he's dead dead, but he is out for the count for very sure. Sadly, as he's going though, in his like death flails, he's able to kill Gardas. Basically picks him up and then as he's falling, he, he gets kind of crushed with King Broad in the Basilican crash. And so the scene closes with Gardas Steel Soul dying and his lightning arcing back to Azir as the very fort that bore his name is wiped off the map. Whew, that was a lot. Okay, let's end this video like we do all of them talking about why is this cool. Well, you know, I have a lot of thoughts on this one. The the Akshi versus Giran Crusade in general. I will say the Giran side did not seem quite as harrowing as the Akshi one. And that could just be because, like, Thorian is a better general. You don't read about the uh, incidents and attacks that they didn't encounter because the general was just better. Or maybe they'll just get their turn in the next book. I don't know. I felt like this one was a much better representation of a free guild army where they're Thorian is giving orders out constantly and the army is reshaping, reforming, uh, new defenses. She's just thinking on the fly. So it feels much more thoughtful than the Akshi one, which makes sense. They're impetuous by nature, but who knows? As I mentioned before, I'm a sucker for Doom Defenses. I loved it in the last story. I love it here. You know, you think of like Helm's Deep from Lord of the Rings, Thermopylae from real history, any of that stuff. Fact or fiction doesn't matter. And and one of the things that it's hard to articulate for, for you guys, if you don't read the book yourselves, uh, I know a lot of folks listen to me instead of reading it. The way that the, the language was in the Akshi last stand, you will, those guys were defeated before that fight began. Right, there was guilt, shame, exhaustion, all of those things were very, very heavy. Malcorn was a broken man. But here in Fort Gardas, they made the same military maneuver, but they refused to just do that. Right, so looking at this, uh, it's clear that some mind is guiding this hurricane of destruction. They noticed King Broad because he started the, the stomping and has been generally bellowing out orders. And where Truce Break was intended from the start to be nothing more than a speed bump, Gardas decided to be a glass cannon. And the one shot they had effectively cut the head off this snake in terms of taking him out of the warband for that moment. Yeah, it was a loss, but with the guiding force gone, this goes back to being exactly what it is. A wild rabble of orcs and gargants who are very, very likely to fight against one another, and even if they don't get into a all-out, drag-out brawl, there is going to be a period of time where someone in this group needs to assert dominance and become the warlord. Horn split it makes sense because he's the next big guy, but there's a bunch of mega gargants who very much outsize him. And then once they even choose a leader, whether it happens swiftly or slowly, that leader might not go in the same direction as the crusade. So like they have full autonomy at that point to do whatever they want. And if they happen to see something more interesting they want to go fight, they'll go to that. In fact, why not just head for Hammerhall Gyra? It could be very interesting. And so Gardas' sacrifice was meant to really shatter the momentum of this army. And it was a cool scene. I thought they crushed it. But friends, those are my thoughts on the final bits of the Guran Twin-Tailed Crusade. I would love to hear your final thoughts now. Um, I feel like there was a lot more military suffering when it came to the Akshi side. But the Guran one, I think, is more interesting in terms of what the day-to-day uh, -day person is experiencing. Their environments that they've had to go through, I think, are already much more harrowing than the Akshi one. The swamp with you know, plague bearers and blight kings all around you, the open field with fog so thick you can't see it, claustrophobic forests. It's just a lot of environmental horrors that are kind of hard to articulate. But I'd love to hear your thoughts. Leave them in the comments down below. And uh, to round out this series, or at least the, the stuff inside this book, I am going to drop a lore video for, um, is it the Trogoth King? Is it Trog? I'll do a video on him. And uh, that'll pretty much cover everything inside this book rather than uh, missions and stuff like that. So friends, thank you so much for hanging out with me. I really hope you've enjoyed this series. It feels good to be uh, back cranking out content 
feels feels like the old days. Anyway, uh, go ahead and click subscribe if you haven't already. It would mean the world to me, and I will catch you next time. Happy Wargaming.